Okay, so we are moving to the very last session of today, the last technical session, uh, dealing with, uh, with something that being in Madrid makes a lot of sense. It's about cities. We have heard before that half of the population nowadays, more than half, lives in cities. It's a big challenge to keep this sustainable, and the prospects are that two-thirds of the humankind will be living in cities by 2050. The zero cities is a wonderful idea. It basically means that there is no emissions, no carbon footprint after all. Uh, there are several principles to take into account and many uh, kind of theoretical ideas on, on how to move into this direction from promoting recycling and voluntary simplicity to networking and connecting uh, different areas of activities that are typically addressed separately. So, Ruth. So, um, I will present the moderator of this uh, panel, who is uh, Nicolo Aste. And uh, he's a full professor in the Department of Architecture, Built Environment, and Construction Engineering in Politecnico de Milano as well. And together with Nicolo, we have on stage five speakers Claudio Del Pero, Isidoro, Isidoro Miranda, Cristina Gamboa, Marike Van Staden and Pamela Lucia Bravo Ortiz. So if you would like uh, to join us on stage. And I will leave the floor to, to Nicolo. Hello, everybody's here. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very proud to be here. I'm very happy to can share with you my passion for uh, sustainability and also my concerns for our common future. You know, uh, I'm a professor at Politecnico di Milano in building physics and energy systems, and uh, above all, I'm an architect. So I am a black sheep in my scientific community. And people often uh, call me engineer, because uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, efficiency is a matter of engineers. And I say, oh, architect. And people is looking at, are looking at, uh, at me and say, yes, yes. So funny, engineer. OK. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, but almost perfect are my panelists. So uh, let me introduce my, <laughs> so energy saving device. It's not working. <laughs> this, uh, the, the wrong button. So I'm an architect. <laughs> the, the, the panelists are Claudio Del Pero, is a well-known face for me, a professor at Politecnico di Milano. He's an engineer. And <laughs> Cristina Gamboa, CEO of World Green Building Council from Colombia. Isidoro Miranda, uh, managing director of Lafarge Holcim, uh, Holcim Spain. Marike Van Staden, uh, director of ICLIS Bonn Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting from Germany. And last but not least, Pamela Lucia Bravo Ortiz, Deputy Secretary of Environmental Planning and Information, City of Lima from Peru. And so, just a few slides to, to introduce the problem of sustainability and architecture. Uh, let's talk about, about evolutions and uh, the evolution of the mankind, starting from the level of monkeys and uh, coming at the upper level of Homo sapiens or sapiens sapiens. And the evolution and the progressive development of architecture has always accompanied 
the evolution of the mankind, starting from the cave to the wooden hut, to the brick house, to the modern international style building, to the contemporary architecture. But what is architecture? And in the common feeling, architecture is a form of art where the architect is a genius and he is uh, conceiving, uh, designing and creating uh, masterpieces. And this architecture is also able to change the image of a whole city, like in uh, Bilbao with the museum uh, designed by Frank Gehry. So there is the artist and there is the work of art. But very often the story is a little bit different. And the energy problems and issues are um, taking over the architecture. And so in this uh, case, you see that uh, the technical plants are like a starship landed on the roof of the building. And maybe this was not the initial idea of the architect. Maybe the, 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 the masterpiece was not, maybe it's not a masterpiece, <laughs> but it, it was not conceived in this way. And if we look at the contemporary architecture, we can see uh, some of the most beautiful buildings of the last decades, uh, designed by Zahadid, uh, Norman Foster, Pei, Jean Nouvel, Renzo Piano, Fuxas, Tadao Ando, Liebeskind, and uh, Frank Gehry again. And what do these buildings have in common? Not the shape, not the style, not the genius of the designer, they are very different. What is the fil rouge who, which binds this building? The massive use of steel and glass. So the architecture is contemporary, but the concept is very ancient. They are green house, and uh, these uh, buildings are responsible of uh, huge uh, thermal losses during the winter and heavy overheating during the summer. And the result of this uh, contemporary, beautiful, magnificent architecture is this. If we think that uh, our buildings and the building sector accounts almost for the 40% of the total energy consumption in the world and on the, of the related uh, uh, impacts, emissions, pollution, we understand that this architecture is not affordable for us. So in terms of evolution, the, we, maybe we have to rethink what we are. And maybe we are not so sapiens, but rather a little bit hypertrophic. So I don't want to be like that. What about you? Thank you for your attention. So I would like to give the floor to Claudio De Pero. As I said, he's a professor at Politecnico di Milano. He's actively involved in research and development activities related to energy efficiency in the building sector and to the exploitation of renewable energy sources. Since 2014, he also participates in many technology transfer and cooperation activities on the above mentioned topics, especially in African countries. So thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everybody. So now after some, let's say, bad news, I, I will try to give some good news so to understand how 
easy could be to decarbonize the building sector. Uh, I start with a general overview on the, uh, on the building sector. So you can see it is well known that the energy consumption of buildings is almost 40% of the uh, total energy demand. And the, uh, the problem is that if you see the future building stocks, uh, we understand that uh, the uh, increase, the, the growth rate is about 5.5 billion of square meter per year. So in 2050, we will, ha we will have more than 400 billion square meter of building all around the world. So it's a very huge amount. And then if we uh, look at the share of this amount of building all around the world, we see that nowadays China is in the first place. Uh, so is uh, in terms of floor area the first country with uh, the amount of uh, square meter at the second place we found uh, we find the uh, united states and then all the other countries but if we look at the future scenario in 2050 we see that the india and africa together we will ha will have a number of new buildings overcoming the numbers of new building of developed countries so africa alone we will reach uh, 2.5 billion inhabitants, so the population will double. This means that we need to properly address how to design and construct these new buildings, because if we do it in the wrong way, we can't solve the problem. And then about uh, the energy consumption of buildings. So if we look uh, at the increase of the energy consumption between 2010 and 2017, the increase was plus 5%. That is lower than the, inc that the increase of the floor area that was plus 17%. So it means that new buildings are more efficient than old buildings. But the bad news, if you look at the other graph in the, in the slide, the energy consumption of the cooling for cooling, building cooling, has been growing very steeply and will continue to grow for two reasons, for the climate change so the temperature are rising, increasing a lot. And also the um, per capita income is increasing. So people are expecting to have higher comfort condition. So 20 years ago or 30 years ago in Milano, almost nobody had the air conditioning system at home. Nowadays is a, is a must. Everybody wants air conditioning because for two months the temperature are terrible. Look at the future expected energy demand for cooling in India, China, and the rest of the world, including Africa. It's a huge amount. So we, it's not enough to think about how to reduce heating energy demand, but we have to face also cooling energy demand. Then last but not least, the CO2 emissions. So they are expected to increase about 40% in the building sector. However, we have to take in consideration that uh, emission, embodied emission, will be in 2050 more or less the same than operational emission because the new buildings will be more efficient. So it means that uh, the operational carbon will reduce. So we will have a 50-50 situation. It means that the construction industry is required to radically change its manufacturing structure to decrease the embodied carbon. So what we can do? We have a strategy and the solution is that uh, pyramid you see in the slide. So we can state that today, putting to get together the knowledge we have and putting together the technologies we have, is possible to obtain near zero carbon building without many problems, according to this overall strategy. So the ground floor of the pyramid is to maximize the building's energy efficiency first, mainly through passive design strategies and materials. So we have to minimize the amount of thermal energy needed for heating and cooling. The second floor of the pyramid is to adopt high efficiency technical system and advanced and control management strategy. So we have to phase out inefficient fossil fuel boilers and to push the use of heat pumps, the use of district heating and cooling and so on. Then the top of the pyramid are renewable energies. So we have to mas maximize on site or nearby renewable energy production and self consumption while electrifying the building sector. Because in a building, it's absolutely possible to generate the, exactly the amount of the energy consumption, also exceed the amount of energy used for heating, cooling, lighting, and all the other 
uh, appliances in the building is feasible. So uh, according to this overall strategy, we defined eight uh, key policy, policy action to be put in practice uh, as soon as possible. The first one is to establish advanced building energy codes to set minimum energy performance level for existing buildings in developer countries. And we have to define specific policy and action for developing countries, so more related to new constructions. Second is to achieve high efficiency building envelope at the negative life cycle cost. So we have to work a lot with industry. And policymakers must develop strategic frameworks to create the proper market condition for low carbon technologies. Then, number three, we have to mandate minimum energy performance standards for heating equipment. So we have absolutely to prevent the expansion of fossil fuel heating and push high efficiency and integrated energy solution. Number four, for sure, we have to promote low-cost solar technologies such as photovoltaics and renewable district heating and cooling. Number five, we have to remove regulation and measures obstructing energy self-consumption. So every user must be able to uh, quickly and easily use the energy generated on the roof of the building with renewables, for example. Number seven, that is strictly related to the previous one, to promote affordable energy storage solutions, both thermal and electric, to maximize the local dispatching and management of renewable. I remind that it's in a building it's quite easy to store thermal energy. Not, not necessarily we have to store electricity because we mainly use thermal energy for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. Number seven, we need to promote training and capacity building activities for the construction sector to improve the knowledge and the skill. And th at the same time, we have to strongly increase the application of climate responsive and integrated building design. Last but not least, we have to promote tailored solution for developing countries, such as, for example, low cost solar thermal system for water heating and clean technologies for cooking. So in conclusion, again, I cannot say that this is a, an easy work, but we have the knowledge and we have the technology to reach the goal. So please, let's go home today with the commitment and the promise that we will do our best to go in this direction. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Claudio, especially for being in time. <laughs> and uh, let me introduce you Cristina Gamboa, second speaker of this session. This, she's CEO of the World Green Building Council. She's graduated in economics, in economics from the University of Los Andes in Bogota. She has a master in international relationship and economics uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Formerly, she was also CEO of Colombia Green Building Council and also has expertise in the fields of economic, research, journalism, and international affairs. Please. Thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna be addressing the topic from the perspective of the work of the World Green Building Council. We were, uh, we're one of the largest global action networks in the built environment. We uh, have green building councils in almost 70 countries, including GBC España. Uh, and um, we represent almost 40,000 companies worldwide with 900 staff. And we are happy to show here more actions, <laughs> more, than, more, than, more than diagnosis because we know what to do now, how do we scale up? So we're very happy to co-author also the building section of the roadmap to decarbonization that is presented today. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, my staff was in the meeting in Milan. It was very interesting to have that conversation of business action networks and having a collaboration with the academic community, but also that voice going forward with uh, actionable solutions. So as I said, I'm here to present the progress of the World Green Building Council and how we're taking, how are we are moving to take us to a net zero economy. So we've heard from the previous speakers of the problems we face. The buildings and construction sector is responsible for a very significant amount of carbon emissions and resource consumption globally, and that's not gonna stop. And uh, it's gonna grow exponentially actually, and most of it in developing countries. 
Uh, additionally, since we spend 90% of our time indoors, I know if you've realized here the lack of uh, natural light and the effect it has on our health, buildings do affect how we feel, do affect uh, through air quality levels, both externally inside our buildings. Air pollution is pretty much also understood that it does come from the unsustainability of our buildings. We have a, a, a good long way to go for the next COP. Hopefully it will be called the net zero COP, as I'm hearing. Um, there's only 68 countries that have building energy codes. Uh, that is uh, slowly not changing. It's very hard process, so the business side of things, the business action that inspires also policy leadership. I was so inspired by the presentation today from Rosario in Argentina. If we would like any city to act, that's the roadmap, and it addresses most of the barriers and the solutions we were seeing in the previous presentations. Um, we have to, the long way to go, I was, I was trying to say also that the national determined contributions, the NDCs around buildings, the commitments that countries do around buildings and the Paris Agreement are really poor. And um, it's not that that's going to be the solution, but as we know, the right policy signal is very important for us to know that that's the direction we're heading, that it's in a, unequivocal, and so business can invest according to that vision. So. I don't have to say much here about this audience that buildings are a critical solution to climate change. It is one of the biggest contributors to the problem, but also represents one of the biggest opportunities as we're seeing. And importantly, it has to be about pu people, our human health, improving sustainability in buildings. So my, my voice here is that we need to act now, fully decarbonize the building sector. We know how to do it. Uh, the vision of the possible is there, both energy use and operation in buildings, but also emissions from materials and construction. And I would like to say a little bit also on the solutions addressed here. I guess the green building movement has come a long way. It's not new, right? I think we've evolved an understanding that those very high-end architecture solutions that didn't speak to other disciplines, right, uh, had to learn head-on what is integrative design to increase, to minimize the negative impact a building has on the environment. What we're seeing now through the net zero carbon pathways is that we need us to think about full whole life cycle it's not enough to build and go. We have to understand the operations phase. We have to understand and track data, and we have to address critically head-on embodied carbon or upfront emissions. Um, and uh, this roadmap also is because buildings do provide us an opportunity to connect with other sectors. And as we've seen in this conference, there's a lot of potential and power to integrate the buildings of, and transport systems, send the right demand signals of industry for decarbonization and reduce overall energy consumption, or otherwise, of course, make it more efficient and green, and of course, facilitate the renewable energy transition. Sustainable development goals are totally interlinked with the decarbonization agenda, and green buildings are the built environment overall is one of the most effective ways to address the SDGs uh, and our network across the world, across the almost 70 countries we operate on, are totally focused on supporting how we create buildings, green buildings for everyone everywhere so we can enable a built environment that helps people to thrive and not cost us the earth. Um, I would also say that um, <coughs> We have been uh, working on pathways to achieve net zero carbon target goals. So one of the key programs and that we, we, let's say, we supported the roadmap with, it's called Advancing Net Zero. Advancing Net Zero basically is how to accelerate the uptake of net zero carbon buildings. It's a project framework that incorporates target dates according to the climate science. As we know, fully decarbonized by 2050, it doesn't mean that we act by 2050, we have to act today. And we know that to get there, all new buildings have to be decarbonized or uh, by 2030. Our definition of net zero carbon buildings are as now it's standard, highly energy efficient, with all remaining energy coming from on-site or off-site renewables. We do have four action pathways that we believe are going to get us there. And I, as I said, measure and disclose in operation. If that's a full change on mindset in the sector. Reduce energy demand through energy efficiency to reach decarbonization faster. Generate a balance from renewable sources on-site, off-site, and off-site where appropriate. 
uh, as a last resort, of course, but uh, importantly, over time, increase and include other sustainability impacts, such as embodied carbon, waste, and water. Um, where are we at? We have been really working hard to improve standards around countries around the world. So using our framework, we, all, we have right now the, at least 10 markets that are deploying LED, net zero carbon solutions to understand what it means for their local uh, reality, their market, but also addresses how to move the industry quicker. For example, the UK, in the UK, the UK Green Building Council recently launched a framework encouraging whole life cycle approach, including emissions both from operational and embodied, and also other schemes in our European GPCs. In Australia, Green Building Council, it's really interesting. Now they have a performance pathway for positive carbon buildings. It's not even net zero, it's positive, permitting, permitting uh, their conversation to be one of the most progressive uh, markets in the world in this sense. The US Green Building Council is the, let's say, the owner of the LEED brand, which is very popular. They also have now, as a result of our collaboration in this program, of a LEED zero pathway. And in Singapore, the focus is also uh, shifting towards achieving super low energy buildings that are prepared and future-proofed through a decarbonized grid. Oh, that went all the way forward. Oh, no, that's it, sorry. Uh, our, <laughs> our, I tried to do uh, slides with n less text, so I got confused. We, we have a great report that was launched in July. It's called the Advancing Net Zero Report. And here we are flagging the key progress in what we're delivering. We have 28 cities that have committed to net zero carbon visions. This week, Helsinki, through our commitment, committed to net zero by 2035. So those dates are rolling forward. The state of California also signed our commitment. And that will include decarbonizing 16 million buildings. And they are committed to enacting regulation to meet their targets. And municipalities that have been signing are also committed to decarbonizing their own buildings. So every actor can do something about it. And that's how we're moving this topic forward. I would like to mention that the bill, we, in Europe, there's a pro program that we are collaborating with the European Commission. It's called Build Upon Two. It's funded by the EU Horizon 2020. We are working in eight cities in, in, in Spain, including Valladolid. And they are going to comply with the EU Directive for Energy Performance. And we're collaborating with the Global Co Covenant of Mayors. So they address the retrofit challenge in Europe. So it's, their codes are there, right? They're great. Nobody uses them. So we're working on how to deploy that. We're working in eight cities in Europe. By 2021, we commit to have 10 more. So it's going to be 18. So it's how to implement those local effectiveness in, in codes. And that is going to be that we are going to have indoor air quality, comfort, particularly for, zones, for people that are addressing energy poverty through the bad homes we have across the regions, but addressing areas where also no, no new building is going to happen. We're working also on that. Our Green Building Council of España also is taking on government action. They're leading the, 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 the let's say, those conversations here. And we, you're going to find there the examples of those cities of those cities taking action going forward, uh, and you can read more there. And thankfully, I'm addressing the report because there's no time. Uh, finally, there has to be a marriage between the operational and embodied, as we said. And uh, we know by 85 endorsers of our embodied carbon report that the vision of decarbonizing the upfront emissions can happen by 2030, slashing by 40%. And then that way, we will start talking about a whole life cycle of buildings and uh, realize a vision of how to address also circularity in materials and uh, be effective in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christina. So the next speaker is Isidoro Miranda, who is Managing Director of Lafarge Holcim, Spain. And uh, he's uh, also Vice President of the Euro European Cement Association, Semburo, and its Spain counterpart, Ofisemen. And he has been active all over the world, namely in Asia, Latin America, and in the USA working on a variety of construction materials like gypsum, aggregates, 
and concrete, and especially cement, I think. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nicolo. Uh, I never thought uh, I was going to have a, such a difficult um, afternoon. I'm the second cement speaker, and uh, I have a, this is a Spain, eh? so I have a terrible responsibility is that you don't fall asleep and get it acquittance to Spanish uh, siesta time. So um, let me get uh, first thing uh, <clears throat> the minute of publicity. As, uh, he has told me, Nicola has told several things that we do. There is only one that pays me. So um, I, I, I need to get the publicity out. So just in case, uh, I, I need to get a job uh, for, for this evening. Eh? So um, Lafarge holds him. Uh, Lafarge holds him. We are active in 80 countries. I know most of, of those, 75,000 uh, people. For those who are not used to the European Swiss francs, which I'll assume is the whole audience, 25 billion euros is, is more than, than enough. <clears throat> Many of you would like to go home this evening and tell to your children and friends, you know, I heard the biggest salmon worldwide company. But unfortunately, the answer is no. I mean, there are two Chinese that are even bigger than us. I mean, uh, once upon the world, we said, you know, we are Europe, we are the biggest. Cement was invented 200 years ago. Uh, the British people will say it in Portland, UK. Some French people will say it in France, Mr. Vika. Uh, I don't care. I mean, Romans uh, used to use it a long time ago. Then we forgot. And then uh, the, the English and the French got us back in track to get the right uh, formula. And since then, we are building um, our houses, this amphitheater, even if you see wood and some painting in the wall, but uh, cement and concrete uh, surround us. And let me also get um, another thing um, out of this scene uh, quite quickly. I mean, we are all talking here about um, CO2, climate change. OK, for us in Lafarge Halls in sustainability, is four things. Yes, climate change is important. Eh? I mean, and I will come back to, to, to this point because, I mean, we are not uh, the largest cement uh, manufacturer, but Alberto eh, very kindly told us that uh, uh, in cement uh, we produce between, depending if you count China or not count China, 4% or 6% of the CO2 worldwide. But I can tell you that Lafarge holds him will have a seat in the European nations of CO2 emitters. Uh, for sure, we will be sharing the seating with ArcelorMittal and with many other companies. But we do sit in, in that league, and we feel the heat uh, of, uh, of responsibility. And this is why we do things. Eh? But believe it or not, uh, we believe that the solution is not only CO2. It's also circular economy. It's the fact that resources are scarce, and you cannot keep using and using fossil fuels, etc. You have to reinvent uh, the wheel, and that will happen to all of us. Eh? We will come back to the reusable glass bottle, forgetting about the plastics, and this will happen. I mean, 52 million tons of reused material we use on a, on a worldwide basis. Environment, I mean, uh, we do care about CO2, but there are many people that live and use our cement that for them tomorrow does not exist. Is only today because they don't get fresh water. I mean, you, you want to know what is the best progress of concrete in your life? You have clean water reaching you. Without cement and concrete, you will not have clean water reaching you at home. And since we were able to develop that, then the health of, uh, of humanity has increased, and then we are able to live more than 80 years. There are many countries in this world that the living expectancy is less than 50 years because clean water does not reach home. And this is extremely important and the same. That's why we, we use a fourth factor to measure our sustainability is that we want to have a positive impact to people. And every year we try to reach 3 million people, small and big. I mean, we have schools for teaching women to get a training and to get a decent job and at least to earn more than the one dollar per, per day that in many, many families and people live in, the, in this world. Having said that, um, why? Why do we care about cement? Why do we care about, um, about cities? 
is because population continues to grow. Eh? And uh, it's been said eh, by Nicolo, but um, the most efficient way a human being can live is one on top of the other. I mean, it sounds a little bit strange, but that's the reality. You want to know, I mean, the people that have no hair, I mean, there are some in the room, they, they, they know what I'm saying very much because the heat always goes up. And the heat always goes up, and the people that have no hair, they carry a hat. They, they try to preserve the air on top of, uh, of their hair. The, the house is exactly the same. Your heat of the house goes up, and the best way to use that heat is that there is someone else on top of you and use the heat. And then you, you put another one, and another one, and another one, you have uh, probably uh, a sky rise. I hope the architects are going to design it very well. But it is the most efficient way to live human beings. And for sure, you reduce the distance between to transport water. You reduce the distance that the children have to go to school. Uh, everything becomes extremely more, more, more efficient. So I'm sorry to tell you that those that want to live alone in the garden outside is the most efficient way you can live is in cities like Madrid, Barcelona, New York. And as Fabio was, was saying, there is one New York City to be built every month, or one Paris uh, city to be built. In this case, it's every week. Eh? So, you know, uh, we, we need to take care of them. So we want a higher standard living. I mean, and the infrastructures that, uh, that uh, these people will need will have to be built. And hence, the responsibility of people like me, uh, cement manufacturers, architects, building infrastructure, um, et cetera. So, I mean, in the next 25 years, 60% of the infrastructure that the human being needs is yet to be built. And that's an important uh, thing to remember. I mean, the problem of uh, climate change, environment, et cetera, is, is big but it's not going to get any simpler. I mean, humanity continues to grow, and these needs uh, are, are... So the low-carbon transition is something that uh, we better start working today and don't wait for the change of regulation, et cetera. So, so, so we really need to, 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 to take care of that. For sure, we in Lafarge Holcim, we have done uh, lots of things. Yes, we are, we are very proud to have reduced 25, 25% of, uh, of carbon emissions. Nobody asked us for that. I mean, uh, we thought it was very important. We, we feel this, the heat of being seated in these United Nations of CO2 emitters, and we started to, uh, to, to work on that. And, and we continue to push towards um, a 30% uh, uh, reduction by doing many things that Fabio uh, before me uh, mentioned to you. So I'm not going to uh, go into, into, into this. I mean, let me, let me tell you that uh, Few numbers have been told uh, in here, for sure. Alberto mentioned the, the, the three to six percent of CO2 emission in 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 in, um, in, uh, in cement. But there is also a number that that was said also before: 36 percent of the CO2 uh, emitted in the world was the shower you took earlier this morning, the milk you heated to have breakfast this morning. How many of you have left? Um, uh, a lamp, a bulb switch on at home. Maybe none, but I'm sure your TV has this red light switch on because it's in, uh, in a mode in which it consumes only 1 or 2 percent, but it's 1 or 2 percent more. Okay? So I'm not going to be like Al Gore. Uh, I'm not so pretentious, but, but the reality is that many things will have to change. Building standards will have to change. Pricing of CO2 is a must. It was mentioned uh, earlier by, by, by Julio. I mean, if we were to double the price of cement, that most likely is going to happen, the price of your house will maybe increase by 1%, 2%, depending on the honesty of the whole value change. But my question is, how many of you did ask prior to renting your apartment or buying your house, how much was going to be my electricity bill? How many of you did ask that question? Because you ask the question when you buy the car, eh? but you don't ask that question when you, you, 
rent uh, or buy your, your house. And for buying, is the biggest investment. Eh? So I think uh, we all need to be conscious of that. Be uh, aware that we in La Farce Holcim we will continue to do research. So Alberto, we have a plant in Germany in which we capture CO2 and when we methanize the, 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 the CO2. And, uh, and here in Spain, we will do a low carbon um, clinker. But at the same time, you, which are the customers, but when Julio said, you don't go to the supermarket to buy concrete. Yes, you don't go. But when you buy your house, you do, okay? So each one of us will have to be alert of this and change our consumer habit. Thank you very much. Ten minutes. Perfect. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Am I going to get paid? No. <laughs> After. <laughs> so, thank you, Isidoro. Um, next speaker is uh, Marike van Staden. Uh, she's direct director of ICLIS Bond Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting from Germany. As director, she leads ICLIS' approach to integrated climate action, working within a global network of almost 2,000 local and subnational governments in more than 100 countries. Based on a very rewarding career, she transitioned from national government to NGO space. At present, she focuses on guiding all levels of governments and on integrated measuring, reporting, and verification to track and analyze the impact of climate action and understand, understand action and investment needs to realize our sustainable future. So, two minutes, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? Are you good? Yes, wonderful. I'm going to illustrate through a project that ICLA is implementing how we work with local and regional and national governments. And what a wonderful transition. We were talking about buildings. Now we move to cities, regions, and countries. So let's get started. The Urban LEDs project is aimed at urban low emission development. So we're helping develop strategies, action plans, and implementation in eight target countries, as well as a number of European cities. Um, and the aim is really to work in emerging economy countries and least developed countries to show that emission reduction is an important component, but we do this in a different way. We call this development, but with a low emission perspective, from high to low to no emissions. This project is kindly funded through the European Commission, and we are extremely thankful for that support so that we practically take local governments by the hand and help them through a process. The project is implemented by ICLE, six ICLE officers, as well as UN Habitat. So we have 68 cities that are working with us that are either learning or sharing or guiding others in a number of countries. Colombia, Brazil, South Africa, Rwanda, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Laos, PDR, as well as India, and of course, a number of European cities. And the European cities we chose because they were leaders in one way or another. Maybe they were really great at developing climate action plans or really great in the building sector. So we chose them from different perspectives. The way we work is through a process. It's not rocket science, but it is very tricky to work with local governments when you lead them by the hand to go towards climate neutrality at the very latest by 2050. But this is what we do through our Green Climate Cities program. And of course, it's a logical iterative process, and we focus on the institutions, on the processes, on the way partners work together. Um, and essentially, it's a basic simple process. You analyze where you are, what you have, and what you do not have, you act, you move, and then you accelerate. And we're bringing that climate lens on top of this work. Now, we focus, of course, on local governments. So they have their own governmental operations, their own buildings, their own fleets, things that they operate and manage. 
that's the place to start because that's the place they can switch very fast and very easily. But we also need to look at the whole community, the whole city, potentially the metropolitan city. This is very difficult because it needs people. You are living in a city. It needs you to be engaged. It needs NGOs, businesses, industries to be engaged. How do we get that? That is the big challenge. So our focus is on people, policy, process, and impact. Now, what does a local government do? Local government, in your context, you might call it a municipality or a district council. A local government operates a geographical territory. And in that territory, you've heard some examples of what they do. They maybe set building codes and building regulations. Uh, they can make, make sure that all new buildings must be passive house standard or whatever. It's their job to do that local through bylaws, through regulations. And quite often, they do not have the power from the national government to act in the space of energy and climate. A lot of the climate work that they're busy with is voluntary. And we are trying to change that to make sure that they are empowered by national government and that they work together between all the levels of government to work better together and to coordinate to enable the local governments to do a proper analysis. For that, they need data. They need to understand their greenhouse gas emissions in the whole community. So they do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. They need to understand the climate risks and vulnerabilities. They do an assessment for that. And this is very much sectoral, but a risk and vulnerability assessment can also be about um, ICT or your economic vulnerability. So we're thinking very broad when we bring that climate lens into the particular activities. Then they act, and we help them to understand how to prioritize actions, how to pull them into a coherent climate action plan. In an ideal way, this should be looking at climate change mitigation as well as adaptation and resilience. We call that an integrated climate action plan. And to do that, it's just more, it's a clever way of working. Many actions, especially in the built sector, actually, if, if you look at them from a mitigation side, reducing emissions, they quite often are also about resilience. So you think about things in a slightly broader and more holistic perspective. This is also the space to work with people, your citizens, your NGOs, uh, your local experts, and as you know, we work in many different countries. We try and build capacity in that country that they can build the future buildings and the future mobility systems that are sustainable and serve those communities. Eventually, we wouldn't necessarily need international expertise. We really need to build stronger local sustainable expertise. Reporting, of course, we want to know what they're doing. So we ask them to report their data, their action plans, their targets, and I will share with you a glimpse on some of the targets we've collected, which is really astounding. From our side, we give capacity building support, we bring in also experts as needed, and we share good practices, but the cities like to learn from each other. A mayor likes to speak to the mayor, the technical people to the technical people, and that is where we build bridges across boundaries, uh, actually internationally. We look at many, many topics. The topics are identified by the local government. Of course, energy is always at the heart. Buildings, mobility, water and waste, you've heard that mentioned already. But also ICT, technology, looking at forestry and agriculture, food production, land use, air quality. There are so many topics that a local government can and should look at when they tackle climate change, when they reduce emissions, and when they plan for resilience. We are working with UN Habitat to make sure that there are principles that are embedded in these action plans. Why do we need principles? These are guidelines which we ask every national and subnational government to put on the table in their design of their climate activities. Be as ambitious as you can. Be as inclusive as you can. Be fair. Make sure that the poor and the vulnerable are taken with you, that they're not forgotten or lost in translation. Be comprehensive and integrated. Make sure your actions are relevant, implementable, actionable. Make sure they're evidence-based. We need to make sure that we work on science-based approaches 
um, and we need to be transparent and verifiable. We have many offers of solutions and support. This is actually an offer to you. Do you want to work with us to put more solutions in our online solutions gateway? We're missing the building sector completely, so I hope we can work uh, with the World Green Business Buildings Council on that. We want solutions that are generic solutions for a local government to say, yes, I want to do something on buildings, and let's look at the portfolio of actions that they can implement. We also look at financing, because this is the gap where we've identified action is not being implemented fast enough. So we're working with a number of partners on the Transformative Actions Program, which is an implementation project pipeline where we enable access to finance. Last but not least, why are we doing this? We want to raise the level of ambition of the NDCs. The nationally determined contributions are not adequate in their current targets. And when we look at this from a resilience perspective, if we're not going to reach our globally set targets, which already looks unlikely at this stage, we need more resilience, more adaptation, much more investment. So it makes sense to look at these actions and implement now and bring that subnational perspective into the thinking. This is my message of hope. It's a snapshot and it doesn't actually give you the comprehensive space. But from the nearly 800 local and regional governments reporting, representing more than 800 million people around the world, we've seen targets of climate neutrality, carbon neutrality, 100% renewables, uh, you name it, it's coming. And that is the message of hope where we can help these local and regional governments that have committed. Thank you very much. So thank you, Marika. Um, I think the last speaker of the day, let me introduce Pamela Lucia Bravo Ortiz, Deputy Secretary of Environmental Planning and Information, the city of Lima from Peru. She's an environmental engineer from the Federico Villarreal National University with a master's degree in degree in senior management and specialization in environmental impact assessment and environmental regulation with experience in the public and private sector. Currently, she works as deputy manager of environmental planning and information and also as deputy manager of natural resources of the Metropolitan Municipality of Lima where she leads the issues related to planning, governance, and formulation of uh, environmental projects, ecosystem protection, and climate change. My compliments. Buenas tardes. Bueno, yo voy a hacer la presentación en español por un tema de facilidad. Las disculpas del caso por, por eso, para los que han tenido que pedir el, el tema de la traducción. Pero en fin, eh, bueno, ya les han comentado, yo vengo de Lima, del Perú. ¿Conocen Lima? Sí, ceviche, pisco sour, ¿no? <risa> Se come delicioso. Bueno, y tenemos lugares muy lindos para conocer. Los que no conocen, bueno, a partir de hoy, una de sus metas de vida va a ser conocer el Perú <risa> y conocer Lima. Eh, bien, he venido a presentarles el caso de nuestra ciudad. Tendría mucho, mucho que contarles, pero no me va a dar el tiempo para hablar de todas las cosas, pero vamos a hacer el intento de ver lo más importante. Eh, estos son algunos datos básicos de la ciudad. ¿no? Tenemos eh, prácticamente 8 millones y medio de habitantes. Esto quiere decir que concentramos la tercera parte de la población del país en, en la ciudad capital. ¿no? Eh, como ya han comentado los anteriores expositores, esto demuestra que tenemos un problema de crecimiento poblacional muy notorio. Eh, crecimiento desordenado, además, porque hay mucha informalidad en el tema de la, de la entrega y ocupación de terrenos alrededor de la ciudad y, por lo tanto, esto implica que esta población que se instala necesita de más servicios públicos, ¿no? acceso a agua, acceso a electricidad, ¿no? y, y bueno, es muy complicado para los gobiernos locales como la Municipalidad de Lima y más aún para los gobiernos locales más pequeños poder gestionar este tipo de acciones. ¿no? Pero también hay muchas oportunidades en esto. Eh, nos dividimos territorialmente en 43 distritos, ¿no? 
eh, lo cual es eh, administrativamente complejo también, porque hay 43 formas diferentes de administrar la ciudad, pero el rol precisamente de la municipalidad de la capital de la provincia es articular y gestionar con los otros alcaldes y las municipalidades locales para ir todos hacia el mismo objetivo ¿no? de hacer una Lima mejor. Eh, tenemos ahí el dato de la superficie, ¿no? de la densidad poblacional, tenemos este, somos un, una ciudad, que, un país que tiene costa ¿no? con el Océano Pacífico, y para mejor organización eh, nuestra dividimos a Lima, o sea, estos 43 distritos los agrupamos en cuatro sectores. ¿no? Este, Lima Sur, Lima Norte, Lima Centro y Lima Este. Para un poco empaquetarlos y que ya no sean 43, sino cuatro. ¿Verdad? Y formamos mancomunidades. Entonces... Eh, como ciudad, como municipalidad metropolitana, estamos tratando de posicionar a Lima como, como una ciudad líder en el tema de la lucha contra el cambio climático. Y para esto hemos este, firmado algunos acuerdos con diferentes redes internacionales donde se agrupan los países que tienen, o las ciudades que tienen el mismo interés, ¿no? Como es, por ejemplo, C40, hemos ratificado nuestro memorando de entendimiento con esta organización y participamos activamente de las diferentes redes y programas que lo conforman, lo cual nos está dando una oportunidad muy, muy importante porque tenemos acceso a experiencias de otras ciudades con, los, con contextos similares que nos están permitiendo aprender y tener nuevas ideas para proyectos que podrían ser mejor implementados. ¿no? Y también, bueno, tenemos este, la designación de nuestro alcalde Jorge Muñoz como miembro del board del GICOM, eh, del Pacto de Alcaldes por el Clima y la Energía, lo cual también es un avance muy importante porque estamos representando a, la, a, la, a Sudamérica y Caribe ¿no? en, en esta mesa y tenemos también este rol articulador a nivel de todas las ciudades que conforman el pacto. ¿no? Eh, para Lima es muy importante participar de este tipo de espacios porque nos interesa conocer las iniciativas que ya se han llevado a cabo en otras ciudades del mundo, pero también conocer... ¿Qué pasó para que lleguen ahí? ¿Cuáles fueron sus limitaciones? ¿Cuáles fueron las, las cosas buenas, malas, bonitas y feas? ¿Qué sucedieron para que puedan alcanzar esos objetivos? ¿no? Y eso nos está ayudando también a mejorar nuestra gestión hacia adentro. Entonces, como les comentaba, participamos de, los, de las diferentes redes y programas de C40 y con el asesoramiento técnico de esta organización estamos desarrollando el Plan de Acción Climática de la Ciudad que va a contemplar un, este, una serie de acciones para poder contribuir a las... Este, bueno, valga la redundancia, las contribuciones nacionalmente determinadas, ¿no? Nuestro país, el Perú, está comprometido a reducir el 30% de sus emisiones y para esto nosotros estamos desarrollando este plan que va a empaquetar todas las acciones que ya se vienen desarrollando pero que hoy no están cuantificadas ni se están registrando como que, eh, como que contribuyen a este compromiso nacional. ¿No? Y este es un problema que pasa en muchos gobiernos locales y es una realidad sudamericana en general. Realizamos muy buenas acciones que sí reducen emisiones, tenemos este, proyectos que van a complementar, este, que van a tratar de, de, de aunar este esfuerzo para llegar al objetivo, pero hoy no se cuantifican de la manera correcta. ¿no? Entonces, esto nos va a ayudar también a sistematizar la información. Participamos también bueno, por, el pacto, por el pacto de alcaldes por el clima y la energía del del llenado de información en diferentes plataformas, una de ellas es el CDP, para tener eh, el registro también de la información que vamos recopilando. Y estas son algunas de las acciones de las cuales podríamos hablar muchas horas, pero las menciono rápidamente. La implementación de ciclovías en la ciudad. Tenemos un proyecto eh, con el cual tenemos el objetivo de que al 2035 vamos a incrementar mil kilómetros de ciclovías. Esto lo estamos trabajando con ayuda del Banco Mundial. Es un proyecto con cooperación internacional. ¿no? Tenemos un proyecto de peatonalización que ya se lleva a cabo en el centro histórico de la ciudad. Eh, para precisamente descongestionar el, la parte central de la capital, ¿no? de, de todo el tránsito automotor. Y también tenemos el programa especial de transporte no motorizado, que es como una dependencia, como una gerencia independiente, que ve todo lo que es transporte sostenible y se dedica a su promoción. ¿no? 
Tenemos otras iniciativas que suman a la reducción de emisiones, como el programa de recolección de residuos de aparatos eléctricos y electrónicos. O sea, ¿Quién no tiene cables, cargadores, celulares que ya no usa en casa o, o baterías, tal vez? Y bueno, este es un programa para, las, para los vecinos para tratar de recuperar este tipo de, de residuos. Nuestro programa de segregación en la fuente, lamentablemente a nivel de ciudad todavía estamos con un porcentaje muy bajo de recuperación de residuos inorgánicos reciclables, andamos por el 4%, pero estamos trabajando para incrementar la cantidad de residuos que, que vamos recuperando. ¿no? Y así estas, entre otras este, iniciativas que, que podríamos ir conversando, ¿no? por ejemplo, ayer tuvimos la grata noticia de que ya se conformó nuestra primera área de conservación regional de la ciudad. Esto implica que se está reconociendo legalmente la conformación del proyecto del sistema de lomas costeras de, de Lima. Eh, las lomas costeras son, este, son pequeños, pequeñas montañas dentro de la ciudad, que son que donde crece vegetación, o sea, se vuelven totalmente verdes, son temporales, eh, más o menos de junio a agosto. Entonces, si van a Lima, tienen que visitar las Lomas Costeras de Lima, ¿no? porque ahora va a ser un proyecto de la Municipalidad Metropolitana donde vamos a poder hacer proyectos de inversión pública y ahora ya está reconocido por el Estado. ¿no? Vamos a, con esto vamos a poder proteger eh, cinco sectores en cuatro lomas de la ciudad y aunque son cuatro de las 19 que existen hoy que están reconocidas como ecosistema frágil, para nosotros es un gran paso haber logrado esto y de que por fin podemos empezar a hacer la inversión. ¿no? Así como yo les comento estas cosas, eh, yo creo que es una problemática general de las municipalidades de Sudamérica y Latinoamérica y Caribe, el tema del financiamiento, el tema del acceso a la información técnica que, que tenemos en el mundo. No hace falta mucha más comunicación de estos temas para poder tener más acceso todos, porque bueno, ahora el mensaje en la COP es mucho, sí, el cambio es ahora, necesitamos hacerlo ya, no vamos a tener una segunda oportunidad. ¿No? Eso es lo que estamos tra tratando de transmitir con todos estos eventos de la COP. Pero, ¿qué estamos haciendo realmente para tomar esto en serio y que realmente sepamos de que va a ser nuestra última oportunidad? No, no necesitamos saberlo nosotros lo que estamos aquí, porque a nosotros nadie ya nos tiene que convencer. Si estamos acá, es porque creemos en el tema. Tenemos que sacar esto hacia afuera. Tenemos que comunicar, difundir, y por ahí también va la parte de la educación ambiental, la educación en el tema de cambio climático que tenemos que aprovechar. Cada uno de nosotros somos actores importantes del cambio. Así que empecemos en casa, los miembros de nuestra casa se irán más afuera y así iremos creciendo para todos poner nuestro granito de arena. ¿Sí? Gracias. Thank you so much. We are the last panel of the day, so we do as we want. <laughs> we have a lot of time. Any questions for our panelists from the public? Not all together, just one. <laughs> Si se puede usar eh, los impuestos municipales para vosotros financiar esos programas de, de reverdecimiento de las ciudades. Bueno, en Lima no se aplica un impuesto para para desarrollo de proyectos ambientales. En el Perú, en general, eh, las normas no nos permiten hacer eso. Solamente tenemos la recaudación de impuestos por un tax que se le dice arbitrio municipal, que se paga para el tema de recojo de residuos sólidos, ¿no? y etcétera. Lo que estamos trabajando como una iniciativa para evaluación es el endose de este impuesto ambiental a los residuos de servicios 
que se entregan, por ejemplo, en el cobro de la electricidad o en el cobro del, del servicio de abastecimiento de agua. Eso es un tema que está en evaluación. Y sobre la parte urbana que, que me has hecho recordar ahora, es muy importante comentar que cuando las ciudades desarrollamos nuestros planes de acción climática, tenemos que pensar que esto tiene que engarzar completamente con nuestros planes de desarrollo urbano. ¿no? y con el paquete de normas que tenga que venir con ellos. Si estos dos instrumentos no conversan, no vamos a haber logrado mucho que digamos. ¿no? Entonces eso también es importante decir. Um, actually, you know, there are a number of financial models that one can use. And taxes is just one of them. So um, ICLA has just released for the COP uh, a finance toolkit including a decision-making tree. So please take a look at that on our website. Um, and it, you click yes, no, based on what you, where you are as a city. It's aimed at, at a municipality. And then you can, it takes you to finance options. Um, and it includes your own financial mechanisms as a local government. But there are many others that are actually also options, including um, public-private partnership approaches, but with the green spaces, quite often that is in the municipal government's budget to plan green spaces and to make sure um, that this is not just a cultural uh, space, but it also cools down the city center. Typically, you have overheating, so you have water features, green space, which makes it nice for people to live in. So that's part of standard urban planning uh, activities normally. Una cosa más complementaria. Eh, es que sí, hay fondos internacionales que nos permiten poder aplicar para desarrollar proyectos. ¿no? Ahí eh, tenemos el BID, el Banco Mundial, en nuestro caso CAF, la Cooperación Andina de Fomento. ¿no? Este, hay organizaciones internacionales como GGGI, que es una organización de, de, con base en Corea, por ejemplo. Eh, el mismo ICLEI C40, ¿no? que nos ayudan con estudios técnicos. Pero para, muchas de estas organizaciones nos ayudan con desarrollo de estudios básicos, estudios técnicos, que son súper importantes porque un problema de las municipalidades es la falta de información de la ciudad que tenemos para poder desarrollar buenas iniciativas. Eh, pero para poder ejecutar proyectos en sí mismos, eh, la dificultad que tenemos es que estas organizaciones que pueden invertir grandes cantidades necesitan que estos fondos sean grandes. Por ejemplo, eh, la Cooperación Andina de Fomento nos dice, sí, pero yo necesito que tu proyecto sea de 10 millones para arriba. O sea, yo no, 10 millones de dólares, ¿no? 10 millones de dólares para abajo, o sea, no, 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 no aplica. ¿No? Y como municipalidad local, que nuestro alcance es un poco más, más pequeño, nuestros proyectos van por los 2 millones, 3, no llegamos a los 10. Entonces, también una de las sugerencias que estamos lanzando a estas organizaciones es que podamos empaquetar, ¿no? que pues, si no se puede, o sea, empaquetémonos con otras municipalidades para poder hacer cosas más interesantes y más grandes. ¿no? I can change a little bit uh, the, the, the subject, but still stay with the municipal authorities. I mean, uh, in uh, the European Union, there is legislation that will require, after 2021, that all the new buildings are near zero energy uh, consumption. I mean, the latest statistics that I have access to in Spain means that, uh, I think it's 2016, the statistic, but they say that 46% of the new houses that are being built in Spain are not thermally efficient. So, I mean, I, I don't know what uh, authorities do expect that is going to happen between 2016 and 2021. I don't know if uh, there's going to be some kind of miracle that all the architects are going to become experts in designing. I can tell you, the technology to make a near zero energy building does exist. It is not revolutionary. It is about insulation, ventilation, I mean, it can be built, okay? So, but uh, either the architects are looking or the promoters or whatever are looking to the other sides and, you know, there is a little bit of an extra cost, maybe three, four percent. And as the consumers, we are not willing to pay this extra cost, but something really is not working. And sometimes we, we say something is going to happen. And the question is more, we, what do we do? I mean, I've been in conference, Heidelberg, uh, uh, a city in, uh, in Germany, the mayor has said very clearly, no housing development in my village that has not a sustainability plan, which means zero energy, waste uh, uh, recuperation, waste recycling, etc. So I don't know why some people do and some others don't. 
you. You guys? Uh, yeah. Um, a question for everyone, really. Um, Claudio uh, talked about the um, eight requirements, um, starting with advanced building energy codes. Um, to what extent uh, is this something that national governments need to do? I mean, how much uh, freedom of action do cities really have if they want to revolutionize the, um, their, their, their building's policy? Yeah, I think that uh, some of that key action should be taken at the national level, for sure. But other action can be also taken at the local level. So if we, have, if we are speaking about, for example, uh, district heating and cooling is something that you can put in practice at in a munici municipality level, or uh, if you are designing a new district in a city, it's quite easy to implement. Also, I have to mention the, uh, the, the situation in, in the region we live, Lombardy. Uh, they decided to anticipate the, the requirement imposed by the European Union to have uh, nearly zero on the building, uh, not, not to, to, to 2020, but to 2016. So all the new buildings uh, uh, built in Lombardy region from 1st January of 2016 are or should be, are expected to be nearly zero energy. So also locally it's possible to implement some key action. It's not necessary to, uh, to work at the national level. So honestly, I think we have a lot of possibilities. We don't uh, have excuses. We cannot uh, wait for uh, a big decision from European Union, from, from the central government, or so on. Also, a measure of a small municipality, as you mentioned before, can do something uh, practical every day. Uh, another point is taxes. I mean, um, you have the new houses, but you also have the housing stock. I mean, by any standard, there are 30 years to go to 2050. So if you want to, to make thermally efficient all the housing stock, you know, more or less three per year, 3% eh? times uh, 30 years, that close to 100%. The, the rate of renewal of houses in Europe varies per country from 0.4 to one and a half. So there are countries that uh, on average, we need to wait 100 years to get uh, the existing stock thermally efficient. So it is very obvious that uh, the, the governments will have to push any kind of tax scheme to incentivize the, the renewal of uh, the renovation of houses to get uh, this, uh, this uh, building stock uh, to be thermally efficient. And I mean, today they do exist. I have spoken to several uh, uh, European Union. Uh, I mean, yes, the money does exist. You need to be an athlete or a doctorate in architecture to, to be able to, to fill all the papers and, and get uh, a little bit of the money. So, I mean, what is it? I mean, it is, we, we lie to ourselves uh, on, on that point. Um, the built environment is very fragmented, the whole value chain. So the, the, right now, I guess, the thing is radical collaboration to get this done. It's not easy. National governments do have a say. We heard already there has to be a dialogue between the energy ministers and the housing ministers who ha have a vision and a direction right. There are, it depends on, also on the governments, if they're central, federal, et cetera. The EU, I, we're, we have a lot of hope in the new Green Deal. Uh, and this is rolling along in terms of very ambitious policy going forward, even about the policies called levels, about whole life cycle, uh, environmental product declaration. It's really ambitious. It's going to be at the forefront of what countries are going to be looking at in the years to come. And of course, it may be slow, but it doesn't matter. That's why NGOs are here for us to collaborate radically in whatever we can share to get the job done. Municipalities are key because they get that inspiration and get things done as the city of Lima, as city of Socorro, and the private sector is the one that's gonna invest. So the, my final thought is, don't forget the power of what's happening with responsible investment in the financial sector. There are great pilots about energy efficiency mortgages out there, 
that are empowering citizens to understand what they're buying. I think people do care a lot what they buy and what, how much they pay. I think they will care even more if they understand it's about the quality of life that children and their families have in their homes. Recognizing that we still have to build and renovate at a very high rate, we can decarbonize we can do this and it doesn't mean that we're not we're, and, it, and it's of course it's going to be delivering value it's about the just transition it's about all companies getting their fair share of how they're going to move forward but it's there is a power of local national governments getting a, getting a signal that this is coming and that is a vision local governments acting through all these networks and this collaboration to get things done and all the other non-state actors plus business, understanding that there is something that we have to significantly shift in order to really get the sector that is very complicated, uh, un un understandably, uh, right? Because we are the first generation that it is gonna be more urban than rural. So, and it's that, that's gonna continue. And if we don't leapfrog the applications in the informal Africa, in Latin America, in East Asia, the world can't handle a high carbon urban environment. That, wow, that was amazing, thank you. <laughs> Just to add on, I think we have an enforcement problem. Um, national governments can make all the legislation and regulations they wish, but if they don't finance enforcement, which normally is dealt with by the local governments, this will not happen. So it's sort of a combination of, of what you've been saying. I also think the insurance and reinsurance industry is part of this conversation because they are seeing the devastation after floods and hurricanes and you name it, and they need to invest in getting things rebuilt. So this is another complex factor, but it's also an important factor to bring to the table uh, the whole insurance industry to make sure that the conversation is broader and more inclusive as well. Claro, desde los gobiernos locales, claro que podemos hacer eh, muchas cosas, ¿no? Por ejemplo, hace poco acabamos de ganar un fondo para un proyecto de calidad del aire por C40. Son algo de 40.000 euros que nos están dando para poder implementar un tema de sensores de calidad del aire, ¿no? Eh, pero ha sido un proceso, como comentaba, de llenar los formularios, de ver que toda la información esté correcta y tal. Y estos formularios, como gobierno local, eh, ya los, los llenamos cuántas veces al año, no lo sé. O sea, el, el, lo intentamos y lo intentamos y lo intentamos hasta que se abre una puerta, ¿no? Y esa es la idea también. Los gobiernos locales, algo que no nos sobra es el financiamiento. Entonces, tenemos que intentar siempre, ¿no? Y en el tema constructivo, Lima está trabajando con Perú GBC, ¿no? Este, con Francesca, ¿no? Estamos en, algunas, ahí, en algunos trabajos con la Gerencia de Desarrollo Urbano, también con el IFC, eh, para poder desarrollarlo, porque como gobierno local una de las cosas que podemos hacer es tener una ordenanza que promueva la construcción sostenible en la ciudad, porque somos los que establecemos los parámetros urbanísticos con los cuales se construye y tal, pero creo que no hay que perder de vista que el proceso constructivo debe ser sostenible, la edificación misma debe ser sostenible, pero también hay que pensar en que eso es bueno, es importante y va a, ser, va a contribuir, pero ¿qué pasa si las personas que luego, sobre todo en edificios multifamiliares, qué pasa si las personas que luego van a vivir ahí no utilizan bien ese edificio sostenible? ¿no? Entonces, si tiene una planta de tratamiento de agua para el reuso de sus propios residuos, etc., y no la saben usar y, y al año va a estar fuera de servicio, ¿no? Entonces, eso también es un trabajo de la municipalidad, por ejemplo, ¿no? El tema de la educación ambiental para que eso sea realmente efectivo. Okay. It's a pity that my Spanish is not so good as my English, so you can understand how big is my problem. <laughs> so the guy in the third row, no, you. You're not a, uh, yeah. So, uh, just want to ask, Christina, you were mentioning something very important about financing and unlocking financing for these uh, investments. And even here within Europe, where we are far more advanced than in many other regions, it is still very difficult to to get this financing because there is a very high, we have to de-risk this financing and there's like a sea 
of tools to navigate this atmosphere, and it's very complicated here. And I'm talking about Europe, where it's supposed to be leading these things. So uh, maybe my, my question is more about uh, to Marike. I don't know if that is in within your uh, competence for ICLE, but is there some sort of plan to make this easy, this navigation, so that not only the municipalities, but also uh, private investors and, and homeowners can go through this sea of tools and, and, and requisites more easily to find this financing and to de-risk it in a, a make it possible? Perdón, hasta que estuvo abajo prendió. Perdón. The first part is there's there's a big job in 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 getting uh, an understanding among industry about standards that can you can classify assets according to their climate risk if you like or their energy performance. Mm -hmm. There's some great work to, being done with green bonds. Is Sean Kidney from Australia? He's with a ESG criteria. There are many now people uh, with all their portfolios of real estate uh, disclosing performance, environmental, social governance, and accordingly, a big real estate, let's say decision maker, institutional investors are able to discriminate better what kind of real estate portfolios they like. A very high performance buildings and green, let's say with green premiums and brown premiums. And so there's some discrimination there. As we saw from the labeling from housing, many and, and from even from Argentina, there's now the labeling kind of like what we see in the fridges from A to G of energy efficiency. And that's becoming more common in cities. So ideally citizens will be able to understand the, the degree of energy efficiency and rating tools have a job to do worldwide. I, I just very quickly said there's 10 new rating tools, zero carbon tools. Those are benchmarks that, that go to a local baseline. And that's the key problem. Baselines around countries are difficult, so it's data, transparency, and how, how that disclosure is made for investors to understand how they're comparing this asset here in this country with this one, how do I compare? What's the value? What's the premium, right? And that's the pricing of the financing we need to unlock at a greater scale. It's not easy at all, but it comes from both ways. Disclosure from the, from the owners of the real estate through ESG, right? And the other way around, uh, regulators asking for better benchmarking versus baselines, municipalities understanding what are their consumptions and asking what is the performance they seek and rolling this out in a consistent way where all the industry can understand where their money should be better invested going forward, that it's climate proof and that we're building for purpose. I think to add on to that, if, we, if you zoom out, out a little bit, um, guarantees are being established by the European Commission through the Global Urbis Program, which identifies urban actions and urban projects as well. Uh, there we need national governments to step in more to give national guarantees for national projects or city level projects to make to give confidence to the investors that their investment actually uh, is worthwhile. So I think that investor stability, investor confidence is a major issue that national governments need to take responsibility for. At a smaller level, it's interesting to see um, some of the cities that have successfully piloted small subsidies for things like solar thermal systems or for improved um, um, renovation for homes and using better materials and so on. So I think it's a mix of things again. And every actor that should be participating in this space needs to better understand its role and its possibilities. I think there needs to be more awareness raising around what can be done immediately what can be done at the short term and what should be done right now. I think the urgency isn't necessarily well understood either. Thank you. So a uh, last question, and I ask for a quick answer from each of, the, of my panelists. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, how is it possible in your opinion to change the mind of architects, of course, but also 
of uh, investors, of builders, of owners, of inhabitants, to reach an actually sustainable architecture. Starting from Carmelo. Ok. Como comentaba hace rato, a los que estamos aquí ya no nos tienen que convencer. ¿no? <ríe> eh, la idea es difundir esto hacia los demás. Por ejemplo, eh, nosotros tenemos un problema importante con algunas industrias cementeras que tenemos en, en la ciudad, porque están justo donde están este, ubicados nuestros ecosistemas frágiles. Pero, ¿qué pasa? Los ecosistemas frágiles se designan después de que se entregan las concesiones mineras. ¿No? Pero en base al diálogo y en base a, a las conversaciones que se pueden gestionar con la empresa, se han podido ver algunas mejoras y, y soluciones. ¿no? O sea, yo creo que sí se puede hacer industria, sí se puede hacer minería, se puede hacer algo bueno, se puede hacer de buena manera. ¿No? Entonces, y, y yo creo que esto está cambiando, o sea, poco a poco los mismos inversores están viendo la forma de cómo encontrar la oportunidad en, en estos temas, ¿no? Así que creo que poco a poco vamos a ir cambiándolo también, ¿sí? Okay. Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, it brings building, it's the nexus points, building, water, energy waste, all coming together in this space where we live, where we work, where we have fun. Um, for me, it links to multi-level governance. Uh, it's not a logical leap for many people, but for me, it, in my work, it is. All levels of government have to better work together and understand the challenges and co-design a work plan with immediate effect. This is, this is for me the logical place. The second, maybe, is each of us. You live in a place, you work in a place. Is your building sustainable? Are you asking the right questions? If not, it's now the time to start asking. Thank you. Lucia. Yes, I guess the first conference where I was faced with this topic was full of uh, passive designers and architects, right? And I came with this language and they were really mad. They were really mad because they thought they were doing a great job and that, what are you talking? We're not doing great buildings. And the thing is that the world has changed and I think the answers that we face, that the problems we face are very complex. So my answer would be, be open to diversity, understand place, understand climate, design for climate, not only for doing a building, design for people, for climate, for diversity, but also for the unforeseeable future. Buildings will have to be resilient. You have to design in the, for, for a, unforeseeable consequences of cooling and heating. You have to do to make sure that's going to be net zero carbon uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, I mean, let, let me put a, a comparison. I mean, you remember or how your father used to buy uh, or your mother used to buy a car, used to go to, to the car dealer and what's available? I mean, uh, I mean, because otherwise you have to wait too long. Huh? I mean, right now you go into internet and you design which model you want, which color you want, and then you click and they tell you, you know, maybe in one week or two, day, two weeks or something like that. Uh, I, I mean, a car is today a system, a system by which uh, Renault or Peugeot or whatever sits with uh, Michelin, with uh, Saint-Gobain, with, with other companies and design a car that uh, they have been able to, to bring it down to three, four liters per hundred kilometers. I mean, uh, when my father bought a car, was 15, 16. So, so this is something possible. Today, when you buy your house, is uh, someone had a piece of land, call an architect, uh, please build me a set of boxes, uh, for as many boxes as you can. Uh, then the constructor uh, will come and say, oh, you know, each one of those is very expensive. I can do it for half the price. So I will put very thin windows, uh, insulation, boo, who cares, you know? Uh, and at the very end, the consumer comes and says, I mean, this is the house. I mean, uh, I think the, the answer to that is that we will need to, to have a whole system that uh, will, will work. And in that system, sustainability of the house will, uh, will be a factor. And I think for that, digitalization is going to help us a lot. For example, today, 
all the architects are supposed to work with BIM, eh? building information modeling, which means that uh, the, the actual owner can, can, can see the house, how it's going to be built, can have an impact of, of how it is going to do. So I, I, really, um, um, I, I really believe that marketing digitalization is going to bring a big plus to the way we, we live. So I think that uh, beside what uh, they already told, we have to do sensibilization in every possible manner. So I do my best with my uh, students of architecture. So before they start to design a real building, I try to do, also if I teach building physics, but the first to stop them. Yeah, the no first two lectures are at about are about climate change, are about uh, how we can change the future energy demand of the building by uh, our own activity. Also, when I install the PV system on my house, I try to show it to my friends to explain the benefit they can get. So we have to sensibilize and to be informed. So we have a lot of possibility today. We can download the beautiful manual we wrote, we can download a lot of publications of reports containing information how to design a building, how to use uh, uh, a building in a brainy way, in an efficient way, how to drive in an efficient way a car. So we must be uh, sensibilized and uh, we, have, we have the possibility to, to get the proper knowledge to do this job. Thank you, Claudio. So I can say that the best panel of the day is over. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and uh, we can uh, close the conference, I, I think. Thank you for being here with us and to be patient uh, with me. And uh, my compliments once again to the organization.